Hey everyone, it's Mr. David again. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed the first uh, case study of our limited wars, which was the Falklands War, kind of a strange and unexpected war. Today we'll look at our second case study for the limited wars. Uh, this is the first Gulf War. Um, and our region here is Africa slash uh, the Middle East. And again, these are regions as defined by um, IB. So we'll use those uh, to push ourselves through. So again, another example of a limited war, but you'll see here, obviously very different uh, than the Falklands. Um, and then after this is completed, you'll now have the knowledge from the two your the two wars to be able to answer the writing prompt, um, which is just an essay uh, based on these two wars, using evidence from these two wars to bring it together. So I look forward to reading your responses there. Uh, but before you can do any of that, obviously I need to tell you about this first Gulf War. So anyways, uh, we'll do the same thing that we did uh, last time, which is to provide some uh, general background um, on kind of this war, and then we'll move into the causes, the fighting, and kind of the general effects. So first off, this war takes place between 1990 and 1991, so again, another relatively short war. I have a timeline that I use a couple times throughout this PowerPoint to kind of track the progress and track the movements, and what you'll see here is that there's action that takes place in 1990. It's kind of the immediate cause to the war, and then there's a few months of kind of figuring out what to do, and then January and February of 1991 is where we actually see the fighting uh, taking place. So, um, you know, again, relatively short. Now, what causes this war? Well, technically, the immediate cause is going to be the Iraq invasion of Kuwait, uh, two countries in the Middle East, and I'll show you some maps so you can kind of pinpoint them. They share a border together. Uh, however, there's some longer-term causes that are occurring before this that we'll also be paying attention to, but technically the major catalyst that brings war into the equation is going to be when Iraq makes the decision uh, to invade Kuwait in August of 1990. Now, who are the two sides? Well, obviously on one side we're going to have Iraq. They are seen as the aggressor. They invade this uh, smaller country of Kuwait. And then on the other side is a U.S.-led coalition. This is primarily the United States in here. Um, however, there are about 30 other countries that will assist with troops and logistical support and uh, whatever else. But for the most part, what we want to be focused on is this is a, a U.S.-led uh, and very much U.S.-dominated. Uh, um, this war is relatively unique, and one of the reasons why I put the capital U.N. is because... One of the reasons why it's unique has to do with the UN um, in particular. This war is really the first time that both the Soviet Union and the United States will agree on something. That's something that very rarely happened um, in the UN throughout the Cold War. So it's just kind of an interesting um, deal that kind of happens here. Um, in addition, this is the first major post-Cold War conflict. As this is happening, the Soviet Union is basically non-existent. Uh, with that being the case, the Cold War has essentially ended. And so, again, the question becomes, you know, what is this new world going to kind of look like? Um, and again, that's one of the reasons why the Soviet, the former Soviet Union, now Russia, uh, will give the United States their support. Um, another reason why this war is unique is because this war is really one of the first times where we see Arab countries coming together to fight against another Arab country, and that Arab country is Iraq, and that's something very rare. Usually we see um, Arab countries in the Middle East kind of sticking together, uh, not going against one another. However, what we'll see is that um, many Arab countries in the region uh, felt relatively betrayed by Iraq's actions to invade Kuwait, and so this is going to help um, fuel them into dedicating troops and other things to give to the United States in this conflict. Um, this war, again, is limited, and some of the things that happen directly after are not going to necessarily be earth-shattering effects. However, this war is important uh, for kind of thinking of the future of the Middle East, and again, we'll kind of look at that um, a little more closely in this idea of kind of the Middle East as a very, very complex uh, region, um, especially for 
the United States. And so anyways, we'll, we'll kind of look at that as we look at the results. Now, the major long-term cause of this first Gulf War actually dates back to a war uh, previously between Iraq and Iran. And so anyways, here is our map um, of the Middle East. And so you can kind of see what's going on here. Um, there's Iraq right in the middle in the uh, yellow. You see Kuwait right to the south and then Iran uh, directly east. So anyways, in the 1980s, the situation in the Middle East had relatively changed. Now, why have things changed? Well, the biggest change that had occurred is that in 1979, we had the Iranian Revolution. And we've kind of talked about this revolution, but again, this is an Islamic, radical Islamic revolution. They're going to take over, they're going to overthrow the Shah, and they're going to establish a theocracy um, in um, Iran. So this is a pretty big deal and a pretty big revolution. Now, one of the other reasons why this revolution is significant is because this revolution sees Shiite Muslims in control. And if you remember, there are um, two major types of Muslims. There's Shiites and there's Sunnis. Um, Sunnis, the majority for the most part, but in the Iranian revolutions, um, Shiite Muslims were able to come to power. Now, this is a threat to Iraq. Now, why is that the case? Well, in Iraq, the majority of the population was Shiite Muslim, but the ruler, Saddam Hussein, and the ruling government was actually Sunni. And so the hope for Iran was that Shiite Muslims inside of Iraq would revolt and would try to overthrow the Iraqi government and kind of establish this greater Shiite control um, in these Middle East countries. And so that becomes kind of a big objective and a big hope uh, for the Shiite Muslim government in Iran. Um, because of some of the actions Iran will take, which are basically going to be kind of like sabotage campaigns, propaganda campaigns, etc., uh, Saddam Hussein will make the decision to invade Iraq. Iran, excuse me, basically saying, hey, look, you know, you, you can't do this. You can't try to mess with my rule. You can't try to get some uh, big revolt happening that's not going to work itself out. Um, so that takes place in 1980, so pretty quickly after uh, the Iranian Revolution, and will actually go on for eight years. And you can kind of see from the map here, um, limited advancement really by the both sides. And so we don't really see Iraq, you know, really pushing super big into Iran and the same thing with Iran things kind of stay relatively the same however this is a pretty brutal war now after eight years what's going to happen here is Saddam will stop fighting and they're going to they're going to they're going to set things away and Iraq will declare themselves the victorious group well again whether or not that's actually true is kind of to be debated However, that doesn't really matter for our purposes. The bigger thing that we want to think about is that this war, which has gone on for eight years, is going to really cripple the Iraqi economy. And so they're going to have all this physical damage. Um, again, wars cost a lot of money. And in order to pay for the war, the other thing is that they took out a lot of loans uh, from other countries. And so the hope here was to be able to kind of recover and repay these debts uh, kind of quickly uh, so things could move on. The other thing is that this additional economic cost for Iraq is not good for Saddam Hussein and the Iraqi government. There's many reasons for that, but the biggest thing is that life in Iraq was pretty bad. Uh, poor, you know, not good life, etc., and so, really, for legitimacy to Saddam Hussein, he needed to institute some types of reforms um, to get things kind of together. And the fact that now he has this huge war bill is going to mean that basically I'm not going to be able to get those reforms that you had kind of hoped for. So, again, something we want to be kind of focusing on and realizing that this war and the massive debt um, it puts Iraq in is going to be a major catalyst for their next action, which is going to help cause the first Gulf War.
All right, the next thing I want to uh, talk about a little bit is just where does Iraq sit? Again, um, even though the first Gulf War takes place immediately after the Cold War, there's obviously a lot of stuff going on in the Middle East during the 1980s, during the Cold War. So we want to kind of think about what's Iraq's position. First off, this is Saddam um, Hussein. Um, you might see pictures of him uh, towards the later part of his life when he was um, finally captured and killed. Uh, but this is an earlier picture. Now, Saddam Hussein's regime was very violent and very repressive, which, again, now we've become kind of more familiar uh, with these kind of violent and repressive regimes, um, you know, killing people that were dissenters, other stuff like that. However, the United States did provide some mild support to Saddam. Why would they do this? Well, we know that the United States, in all actuality, doesn't necessarily care too often in the Cold War if they're supporting someone that's a military dictator or something like that. But the bigger reason is because the United States saw Iraq and saw Saddam as being somewhat of a counterbalance to the very radical, very anti-U.S., anti-West um, Iran that had just emerged after the Iranian Revolution. So trying to kind of have that counterbalance with Iraq uh, was an important thing for the United States. So the major thing that's going to happen here is that there's going to be big trading taking place between Iraq and the United States, as well as other Western countries. And Iraq, by the way, big center of oil, so a lot of it's that, but there's other things going on. Now, this is a tactic we've seen the United States use before, and that tactic is that with trading and with economic investments and other things from the United States, um, Saddam would have to kind of moderate his behavior. He can't be a incredibly kind of crazy and doing insane things or else the idea was that he would lose U.S. support. So this was kind of the overall idea um, in the 80s. Hey, look, let's, let's continue trading with him. Let's see how that kind of looks. And then maybe he'll moderate his behavior and not have so many human rights abuses. There's also something else going on in the 80s, and that's the fact that the Soviet Union is focusing on internal reforms. Again, we kind of talked about this. We'll spend more time talking about it this year in the world history of the Cold War. And that's the fact that the Soviet Union's influence in the Middle East has really declined in the 80s. They're focusing on glasnost. They're focusing on uh, perestroika. They're, they're worried about that kind of stuff, which means that they are going to leave um, their major influence in the Middle East. Well, that causes a problem because many Middle Eastern countries were reliant on the Soviet Union for trading, diplomatic support, military support, other things like that. And so when you have this vacuum, what's going to start to happen here is the U.S. seeing themselves as relatively strong is going to start to come in and fill the vacuum. And again, they have various motivations for doing so, but obviously... For many in the Middle East, this brings up kind of a variety of different suspicions going forward. Um, again, what we're going to see here is that in the 80s, the U.S. influence in the Middle East will be pretty strong and, and a lot. And so, again, um, that's going to help lead to some resentment from many who think the United States is trying to kind of impose their major influence in the region. All right, now it's time to move into some of our more short-term causes and what's exactly going to take place here. Okay, well, into the late 80s, early 90s, it's becoming more and more clear that Saddam's behavior is not going to be moderated, no matter what type of economic aid, trading, support, whatever the United States and Western countries are going through. And what we see is numerous human rights abuses um, happening. And in 1990... Uh, when Saddam has a British journalist executed on basically made-up spying charges, it's becoming more and more clear that this this is not a beneficial relationship. There's no way in which they can get kind of Saddam to moderate his behavior, and so there might be other action that needs to take place to kind of get things on the right track. There's also another problem, which is that there's a big belief that Saddam is building up missiles and WMDs, what we refer to as weapons of mass destruction and again um this was very scary saddam had used uh chemical attacks in the iraq iran war other things like that so the fact of somebody like this 
having uh, these types of weapons and things like that is all is very very serious. There's also numerous threats that Saddam makes against Israel. And again, we don't talk about Israel too much in this class, but what is really important to realize is that after World War II, Israel is created as a Jewish homeland and becomes basically the biggest ally of the United States in the Middle East. And the United States becomes committed uh, to trying to protect Israel, making sure Israel is okay. So when Saddam says, you know, that he's going to use chemical weapons against Israel. And when he says that Israel is the enemy of all the Arab countries, uh, this makes the United States relatively nervous. So the United States definitely has their eyes on Saddam and what he's doing in uh, the Middle East. There's also a big issue with Iraq and Kuwait. And again, as you can see here on the graph, Iraq relatively big, Kuwait just uh, south of them, not very big, but at the same time, they're going to share a border, and that border is going to cause some issues. One of the biggest border disputes and issues comes from what you see in the orange here, which is the Ramalia oil field uh, right on the border, and it's technically part of Iraq, but Iraq is going to be claiming that Kuwait was exploiting the oil field for their own profits, um, not a good situation, especially when you're dealing with someone who was basically as unstable as uh, Saddam. Now, there's another thing going on here that also involves Kuwait. Um, there's other countries involved here that did this, but in particular, Kuwait had loaned Iraq quite a little bit of money um, in the Iraq-Iran war, several billion dollars. And so Iraq is going to basically demand that Kuwait cancels the wartime loans and debts that they'd given them and give them more money. And obviously Kuwait is going to say, no, you're crazy. The other thing is that Kuwait also produces a lot of oil. And so Iraq is going to demand to Kuwait to lower their oil output. Again, simple economics here. The less you have of something, the price goes up. And so Iraq's trying to manipulate the oil market in kind of an unfair uh, way and Kuwait's basically going to say to both these things, no, this is ridiculous, this is insane, this can't happen. Now, the major immediate cause that's going to warrant U.S. action and international action is going to be when Iraq finally makes the decision to invade uh, Kuwait. So, anyways, um, by mid-1990, the situation between Iraq and Kuwait had gotten even worse. Um, again, the same idea, Iraq saying that Kuwait was taking from the Ramalia oil field. Um, they are going to be blaming them for some of the oil prices and saying Kuwait was producing too much, so it was driving the price to be too low, um, etc. Um, now, the other thing that's going to happen here is that Saddam is going to claim that the fact that Kuwait did not cancel the wartime debts is going to be an act of aggression. Again, that's why I put this in parentheses, sorry, quotation marks here, because this is like, what? That's not an act of aggression at all. It's their money. They deserve it. But at the same time, this is what's going to kind of trigger, or at least Saddam trying to provide justification for him sending troops into Kuwait. So what's going to happen is in about July of 1990, he's going to start to move soldiers towards the Iraq-Kuwait border, basically waging for a full-scale invasion. Now, there were still some attempts to resolve this crisis peacefully. Uh, you're going to have some other powers, you know, trying to get in here, in particular OPEC, which is in charge of um, oil production of all the oil exporting countries, uh, trying to kind of deal with the prices of oil to make Iraq happy. You also have Iraq and Kuwait meeting up you know, trying to figure out a, a solution to this. But at the end of the day, none of this will make any difference. The other thing is that, again, we see this a lot with limited wars. We see it with a lot of wars, period. But sometimes miscommunication is a major factor that leads to big mistakes. And so Saddam is going to meet with a U.S. ambassador. And basically what's going to happen is Iraq um, and Saddam in particular will incorrectly think that if they invade Kuwait, the United States was not going to take action. 
And so this is one of the things that's going to say to Saddam, hey, look, we're good to go here. Let's take care of business. And so in August of 1990, um, he's going to send in a massive amount of soldiers, tanks, etc., to uh, overtake Kuwait. And again, um, this is a very aggressive action uh, that's going to come in here. And basically what's going to happen is within a few weeks, Iraq is able to take over Kuwait. The royal family in rule of Kuwait will have to flee the country for their safety and Iraq will claim Kuwait as their own. And so now you have a serious problem as you have a country invading another. And again, you can see the situation here. Again, this is only within a couple weeks. The Kuwait military is no match for the Iraqi military. Okay, so at this point we have one country attacking another. So the question becomes, what is the international reaction? Well, the United States is going to be relatively upset about this. Um, again, this is an act of aggression uh, by all case of this. Um, this is a UN violation. Both these countries are UN countries. This is one UN country attacking another. That's not to be tolerated. And again, uh, we'll talk more about the UN this year, but the UN is not like the League of Nations, you know. Stop, don't do that, don't do that. No, no, it's much more beefed up, it's much more serious, and again, they just don't accept uh, these type of um, it, situations going through. The other thing is that by taking over Kuwait, Iraq has now taken over a lot more oil production, and so what this means is that they can really manipulate um, oil production in a very unequal way to really only benefit them. And what that would mean would be most likely that Saddam would want to limit the production of oil in order to try to drive the prices up, which is not what's supposed to be going on um, here. Um, what we also have is some kind of uh, miscommunication also as it uh, pertains to the Arab states. Saddam thinks that the other Arab states of the Middle East are basically going to say, hey, you know, whatever, you know, you're Iraq, etc. Instead, though, many Arab states feel relatively betrayed uh, that Iraq had invaded another Arab state. And so with that being the case, this is what's going to lead many of them to come into coalition with the West um, and in particular the United States. And so that's just something that we want to be looking at. So how does this international reaction take place? Well, the first major thing that's going to happen is the UN Security Council will approve economic sanctions on Iraq, trying to cripple them. And again, economic sanctions is the primary weapon used by the UN. Um, this is also a weird situation. This is something I brought up kind of in the overview. Uh, these sanctions the major sponsor of them is going to be the United States and the Soviet Union will give their support, which again was something that just never really happened um, in the UN Security Council throughout the Cold War. So what we're going to have is U.S. troops beginning to arrive in Saudi Arabia um, into an operation known as Operation Desert Shield. And at first it becomes uh, training, you know, and things like that. And then this will actually move into a full-scale um offensive to push the Iraqis out of Kuwait. Now, it's just worth us warranting, and we like to do this when we talk about wars, especially limited wars, why no peace was able to come uh, to play here. And so, again, there's a few reasons for this. First off, it's not to say that there aren't attempts at peace. Um, there is some negotiations that are brought up, some concessions, um, etc., However, the reality is Saddam is basically unwilling to withdraw from Kuwait by any means. Well, again, if that's not going to happen, then peace is going to be almost unattainable and unachievable. Um, there was also an idea, especially within the United States, which was kind of just let the sanctions run their course. They'll hurt Iraq hard enough. But they again, sanctions don't usually happen and have a big effect overnight. It takes some time. Um, however, there is impatience within the United States over sanctions. And the biggest person behind that impatience is going to be the president of the time of the United States, uh, George H.W. Bush, who you see here in this photo. 
um, who's going to say, look, just because we have these sanctions doesn't mean peace is going to happen. We're dealing with a very, you know, brutal guy, a very um, it, it kind of crazy guy who seems willing to do whatever. Um, so we need military action. That's really the only way we're going to be able to solve this. Now, it is still important to realize, though, uh, that even though that is the case and there will be military action that takes place, those UN sanctions will be in effect throughout kind of the entirety of this conflict, and they are going to be very hurtful to Iraq, who's going to basically be unable to get the supplies and other things necessary in order to fight kind of um, a bigger war. Now, again, another thing, and again, we kind of already talked about this, is that Saddam really miscalculated U.S. actions. If we really think about this, actually, this is the first major war that the United States is going to be in since Vietnam. And Saddam kind of thought, hey, the United States is not going to risk a war to, to come over here and deal with this. Wrong. Vietnam is now gone. There's other things that have happened that have led to kind of U.S. confidence and realizing, hey, look, we can still come in here, settle conflicts um, internationally, and it doesn't have to be such an issue like, you know, something like Vietnam. There's, there's an in-between there uh, that we can reach. Okay, so let's look at the outbreak of war. So again, it's August of 1990. We have the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait. Now it's time to get into the wartime. So the UN will approve a resolution to basically push all, any and all measures to get Iraq out of Kuwait and restore the former Kuwait rulers. And this passes relatively easily. Desert Shield now will become Desert Storm. And again, the biggest thing that you want to take out of this is that there's a clear goal. It's basically one kind of major goal. Push Iraq out of Kuwait, restore the borders of the two countries, restore the ruling family back to Kuwait. You know, that's what it is. But again, um, the idea is if you're able to get Iraq out of there, that's how that's going to take place. Um, so officially what we see here is that this military operation will begin to take place on January 16th, 1991. So again, you can see about a five months, month lapse between when Saddam invades Kuwait and when actual U.S. military action will be coming into play here. Now, there's going to be two major parts to this war and how to get rid of Iraq from Kuwait. The first, which is going to be very dominant for the United States, are bombing attacks. And the idea here is you bomb military targets in Iraq, you bomb Baghdad, um, and other things like that in order to kind of show Iraq that you mean business. The other component of this Operation Desert Storm is a ground campaign. And the idea here is that this is when you're going to officially push uh, the army in or your ground troops and you're going to push back um, the Iraqis. So we'll take a look at both those um, as we go through. But what we'll see here is it's relatively quick. Um, how fast this stuff happens. Now, I'll go through kind of the way the fighting is fought, especially in our major theaters of the air and land. However, what you always want to be looking at here is that one of the reasons why victory will be so swift is that the American forces have far superior weaponry, far superior equipment, etc. Um, in, in comparison to Iraq. There's just no kind of comparison and so this is what's going to make the United States very dominant as they fight this war. Um, again, a lot of these are very new technologies. Uh, night vision, we're going to see um, other types of systems that are going to come in here and be very, very effective in, in bringing this in. And again, you have to remember the timing of this war. This is right after the Cold War. This is right after mil the military spending increases that we saw in the 1980s under Reagan. And so now... The United States really didn't have to use that technology against the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was, you know, barreling downwards. But the United States had it. And so now they get to basically demonstrate and show this technology. And again, it's very, very impressive. Um, anyways, this is just a timeline so you can kind of use as reference so you can see this. But again, you can see that this is going to move relatively quickly. Um, and again, what we see here is in August, we have the official invasion and then we move into um, January, 
where we're actually going to see the fighting taking place. And you'll see here that on January 16th, on the bottom the timeline, that's when we have the air campaign. And then a little over a month later is when we'll actually have the ground troops coming in. And, well, spoiler, but, but you can see only um, four days later, um, after the land campaign or war on the land begins, um, Iraq agrees to cease fire and, you know, it's, it's over. So pretty... Um, interesting. So we'll kind of look at why this happens so quickly. Why does this occur um, in such a way that benefits the United States? Okay, so our first major place of fighting is going to be up in the air. And this is, again, the first major component, which is war in the air. So how does this work? Well, first off, the United States are going to be using very sophisticated B-52 bombers. Uh, first night of war, by the way, these, these bombers take off from Louisiana hit their targets in Iraq, and then come back home. Uh, so pretty impressive. Longest bombing run um, in history. Now, what makes this so critical? Well, what we have here is very good technology that improves accuracy. And so what happens is you're much more likely to hit your targets, which is exactly what's going to happen. 89% of the missiles dropped by these bombers are going to hit their targets, which is incredibly impressive. That's a very high accuracy number, which means that you're able to really maximize what you're able to do on these attacks. Um, this air power is incredibly effective. Again, one of the biggest reasons why it has to do with this accuracy. Um, you also have other technologies that are coming in here that are all going to lead to the destruction of Iraqi military targets. And so again, you're really able to establish this. And really, this is established basically on the first night of the campaign, uh, but will continue on as this is really kind of effective and is able to destroy the targets that were um, intended. Um, because of just how swift and how good this air attack is, uh, what we see is basically the United States is a, and their coalition is able to win the battle in the air relatively quickly and the Iraqi Air Force is going to have to basically be on the defensive for basically the rest of the war here. Um, and again, as fighting kind of continues, what we see is more targets are able to be destroyed um, and you're hitting the targets that are necessary. So again, they're not really targeting you know, cities or anything, they're targeting strategic centers, they're targeting command structures, they're targeting other um, Iraqi military targets, which means that Iraq is going to have a lot of trouble being able to fight this war altogether. Um, because of this bombing campaign, what we see is the destruction of Iraq infrastructure. And so once this happens, um, again, Iraq's going to be in even a worse economic position. You have um, a lot of destruction that's taken place. And again, what what happens here is this means that Iraq is going to be really unable uh, to fight a prolonged war. Or really, quite frankly, a war of any sorts. Alright, the next place I want to draw you to for the wartime is going to be the two other places where war takes place on land and on sea. Sea only gets kind of an honorable mention. It's land. That's going to be the bigger one that we're going to look at here. When the war hits land, the other thing that we see is not only are U.S. supplies, U.S. weaponry on the air much more sophisticated, much better, we also see U.S. tanks that are really, really good and much superior to the Iraqi tanks. Uh, speed, uh, firepower, everything. So these are going to be basically no match for Iraq. Um, there's a couple uh, new kind of technologies that are being used in 1991 in this first Cold War by the U.S. tanks. Uh, they're going to be guided by GPS, so you're able to navigate through the desert. Again, if you look at this image, it looks as though they have no idea, you know, how would you ever know where you're going? However, through GPS, they can really identify and take, um, you know, any way possible. That's going to be the most effective. We also see that these... Um, tanks and soldiers now have night vision equipment, so that means they are able to um, hit targets at night, which again, it gives you an advantage when you're able to see and the enemy is not. What we also have is as this ground campaign is coming in with tanks and soldiers, we see that that effective U.S. air power is able to support the ground campaign. 
And so what you're able to do is you're able to kill Iraqi troops and kind of ease the way uh, for these tanks and all the rest to be able to come in. Um, again, as that timeline shows, within four days, the United States has officially won the land battle. Um, and this is when we see Iraq cave in and basically say, okay, we, we got to stop this here. Um, just so you can put a familiarity with the major commander on land um, during the first Gulf War, uh, Storman Norman Schwarzkopf, uh, kind of an eccentric guy, but nonetheless, he's kind of uh, the major uh, commander um, of the U.S. coalition forces, so we want to give him some credit for what he's able to accomplish in this. Um, now, the U.S. does deploy some carriers on the sea uh for the fighting to take place there um however again you're, you're kind of in the desert so there's not that much water however the bigger thing that i want to draw your attention to when it comes to war on sea is the fact that the war on sea is going to be primarily to support the embargo on iraq and make sure they're not able to get the supplies um, necessary to be able to fight. And so that's going to be kind of the critical component of the war on sea. So again, you can see that Iraq has pressure from basically all fronts uh, that's going to make fighting this war nearly impossible for them. Um, so by February 28th, 1991, Iraq has you know surrendered, agreed into a ceasefire. And so now it's time uh, to deal with kind of the effects and see what's going to happen as a result of this war. Um, again, you see here we have um, some troops uh, on the land with these uh, very sophisticated new tanks. Uh, this is Storm and Norman, and so again, um, want to give him some credit for what he's able to accomplish um, in the first Gulf War, particularly um, on the ground campaign. And again, just showing you this timeline once again. Uh, so you can see just how quickly this moves and how crisis is able to, you know, be averted. And again, one of the reasons why we see this as a limited war, well, certainly, I mean, the timing speaks for kind of itself. Okay, so always we want to look at why did the U.S. coalition win and why did Iraq lose? Well, timing is a big part of this. And again, because the Cold War had just ended, the United States' military strength is at its peak. What you also have is the Soviet Union, who now that they know they're not fighting in a Cold War with the United States anymore, are willing to give their support. Which again, um, if this had been during the Cold War, the the Soviet Union would have not done that. They would have they would have been much more um, aggressive on trying to counter the United States. But because the Cold War has basically ended, um, they are more than happy to. Um, give their support to this um again as we've kind of gone through the quality of the military technology is just so superior and it's so good and again it's no match for really any country in the world at this point but especially not against iraq and again that's going to be a big reason why um the united states is able to be successful and do what they do we also want to look at saddam's heirs because he definitely makes quite a few um Saddam, by the way, we do want to realize that he, like we said earlier, he kind of miscalculates the U.S. and other things like that. Um, another problem for Saddam is Saddam is fighting a political battle back home. And again, he's trying to maintain support for his oppressive and violent military uh, regime. And so because of that, you know, he has to dedicate troops into protecting himself and protecting his uh, government from you know, a revolt or something. So that means he's not even able to dedicate the full amount of troops probably he would have like wanted to uh, to fight for. Okay, so let's look at the results and kind of talk about what happens here. Well, obviously the war is very successful in its aims. And again, some would argue that the United States could have continued and actually, you know, fully invaded Iraq and possibly taken over. But that was never the aim. The aim was to push Iraq out of Kuwait and restore the borders and restore the government. Well, 100%, that's exactly what happens here. Uh, for Kuwait, things turn out well. Their sovereignty is restored. They're in good shape, um, etc. And so that's really kind of a good deal for them. 
for the most part, though, the Middle East is going to stay relatively the same. And again, still conflict, still hostility, etc. But a big thing that we want to realize here is that Saddam is still in power after the war and will continue to be in power uh, until 2003. So again, this war does not upset him from power. Um, it's just going to be more of a objective for him to try to maintain support considering this uh, military victory. Um, what we also see is that this war brings about some divisions over the Middle East. What exactly do you do in regards to this place that's very uh, kind of troubled? And, you know, how do you kind of deal with, you know, what to do here um, and, and all the rest of that? So, again, that discussion uh, will not necessarily go away. It continues to kind of sit at the forefront. Um, let's talk about the specific effects for Iraq, um, because obviously they are kind of one of the major countries, if not the most major country that's going to be effective. So first off, for Iraq, this is a complete defeat, and what we see is that they are able to be pretty easily pushed out of Kuwait and not really fight a very good military battle. What we see is that we do have a high number of casualties for Iraq. We're estimated about 20,000. Um, when I tell you the casualties for the Allies and the United States, it's much, much lower. But again, it's a very different type of fighting, a lot more ground troops, um, etc. So again, 20,000 people, you know, in bad spot. Uh, we want to kind of draw attention to that. What we also see is because of this war, we do have huge physical damage for Iraq. Um, again, we have to deal with these money problems that are going to happen here. Um, loss of power, facility destruction, road destruction, bridge, you know, all these other things that are brought on through war, but especially through a major bombing campaign like the United States placed onto um, Iraq. Uh, the damage to Kuwait is relatively extensive as well. Um, so again, trying to rebuild that is going to be kind of a major objective. We also have to realize there are environmental um, costs that come at this. This primarily has to do with oil spillages that are going to really hurt a lot of, um, you know, marine animals, sea animals, uh, stuff like that, um, that we want to kind of be paying attention to and, and kind of looking at. So again, there is an environmental cost to this as well. However, for Iraq, it is important to realize that the reality is it's not like this loss brings about all these rebellions to try to Upseed Saddam or anything like that and instead uh, what we see is that Saddam will stay in power he will be in power uh, till 2003 that being said life in Iraq remains tough for most of our people there poor conditions poverty um, all the rest of those type of things and so again this war doesn't necessarily solve that at all the other thing is that this war brings about Iraq under very close scrutiny by the United States and by the United Nations. And so they're going to be watching very carefully to make sure Saddam isn't doing anything foolish. Um, the major fear is Saddam building up weapons of mass destruction. So there's a UN resolution that's passed that basically forces Saddam to open up his country to inspections and other things like that. Okay, so let's talk about the results for the United States, uh, for the UN, and then for the Middle East, just kind of generally. So first off, for the U.S. and this U.S. coalition, this is a complete victory. And again, they were successful in their aims, uh, showed their military strength, military might, really, really impressive. Very, very minimal casualties. Um, for the United States, about 150. Um, and then other coalition countries, you know, in the 20s, 30s, stuff like that. So again, not nearly anything uh, compared to what Iraq experiences in the same conflict. For the UN, one of the big things that's going to happen here is kind of what I mentioned earlier. Um, they're going to pass UN Resolution 687. And so what this does is it opens Saddam up um, with all its kind of weapons programs and making sure that the UN knows at all time what Saddam is doing and making sure he's playing by the rules. He's not doing anything that would be seen as, you know, aggressive or building up weapons of mass destruction, etc. Well, unfortunately, the United States thinks Iraq is hiding stuff and thinks this 
uh, regime has gone on far enough. And so this is what's going to help lead um, in 2003 to when the United States decides to invade Iraq. Um, a lot Again, kind of stemming from this, certainly um, the idea here that, you know, uh, Saddam was not playing by the rules. He was building up weapons of mass destruction or plans to. And in order to deal with that, he had to be upseated. But again, it won't be until this moment that Saddam is actually taken out of power. And, um, you know, the Iraq war that starts in 2003 is not going to be like this first Gulf War. Quick victory, U.S. in and out, able to restore legitimacy. Um, this Iraq war in 2003 is going to be a lot more complicated and a lot more challenging and really a, t a really a challenging and tough war. This war is also a show of the fact that the United States is now the one power of the world. And there's not going to be, you know, two power, two superpowers. No, it's the United States. And they've shown themselves to be the dominant power at this point. Which means that, well, means many things. But one of the big things is that the United States now has to play a dominant role in the world. And they are going to be the ones to try to mediate in conflicts, try to settle conflicts. And again, in a situation like this, where we have a country going on the aggressive, what we see here is that this is the United States' is basically responsibility now uh, to come in and, and deal with this. Now, for the Middle East in general, um, again, they do join in the coalition, many of these uh, countries, to fight off the aggressive Iraq. However, after the war, there's a lot of hostility towards the United States, and the Middle East is concerned that the United States is just trying to support their own position, uh, trying to really influence what goes on in the Middle East, and basically be involved in an area where they have kind of no business doing anything like that. Um, as far as the Middle East, after this point, it's not like U.S. influence leads to fledging and democracies in the in the middle east instead we see very minimal democratic improvements um happening um which was kind of a a tough time for the united states who had really hoped that this would happen um however we do want to realize that um this war does kind of show us the complexities of the middle east and after the cold war and especially after 9 11 for the united states uh, their focus turns to the middle east but again as far as this war is concerned we can see relatively limited, relatively quick, United States able to come in, take care of business, push um, the aggressive Iraqis out. Okay, thank you so much. I hope you enjoy uh, learning about this first Gulf War. And now you're ready to answer one of the writing prompts that is associated with this module. Have a great one. And after you do that, you can move on into learning about the Chinese Civil War.